First of all, I want to thank everyone who somehow found this channel. I was about to make a video for each of the starters separately, but I think it's more worthwhile just to make one big video and then later come back when whenever I have the resources to, to do a deeper dive on each of these. Now there is a reason why I held off on making these videos, but I'll explain that after I talk about my design process for starters in general. But for now, in these videos, I'll pretend as if these are still like Pokemon, even if they are. Alright, so the Slugant line is based off the Ecological Pyramid, aka the Trophic Pyramid, aka the Energy Pyramid. And moving on, you first start off with a producer, aka an Autotroph- Stop. Alright, who makes biomass out of stuff that isn't biological like sunlight or chemical vents. Slugint is specifically based off of the Elysia Chlorotica, a slug that doesn't start off as a producer, but they become a producer as they use the algae they eat to photosynthesize by themselves. Now the hidden ability of this line is currently just gooey, instead of something like chlorophyll or solar power, because the other stages are consumers. So speaking of, Slugent evolves into Herbipod, an herbivore, aka a primary consumer. From this stage on, they are all called consumers or heterotrophs. Herbipod here has goat pupils and eyes on the sides of their head to maximize their field of view because they need to be aware of the next stage of the trophic pyramid, predators. This leads us to Omnilusk, a carnivore. They could be a secondary consumer or tertiary, quaternary, it all depends on how many links there were before whatever they ate. Both carnivores and omnivores can be in this category, but Omnilus care is based off of a specific carnivorous plant, the sundew. This plant still photosynthesizes as a producer, but the soil they live in lack nitrogen. So they develop sticky ends that can trap and roll up bugs for the plant to digest and get their nitrogen that way. They also gain a toxic poison type, even though sundews are not poisonous. Patink's line is also about energy, but in a different context. If you ever wondered why I always pronounce patink this way, it's because it's based off of potential energy. This is energy that is stored but has the potential of moving or doing something else. That's why they wear their skin like a loaded spring, which is one type of potential energy. This also makes patink relatively slow and more defensive as they're getting ready to spring out. Skinetic is a kinetic skink. They will be zooming around and spending all that energy like a moving roller coaster. Kinetic energy is what objects in motion have. You can actually calculate how fast an object would move if you know how much potential energy it had to spend in the first place. Skinetic speed has jumped up, even if that makes them super vulnerable. But they are using all their energy on the offense in this stage. But when potential energy becomes kinetic, not all of that energy makes the transition. This quote-unquote energy loss is due to some of that energy becoming something called thermal energy. Whenever anything is in contact and moves against something else, there's friction, a force that opposes that movement. With friction, some of that energy that is meant to contribute to kinetic motion is spent to warm up the object instead, turning the potential energy into thermal energy, like rubbing your hands together. It makes them warm. Skirmel's hidden ability is contrary, because they are going under friction against the ground to make the thermal energy. Remember though, friction is a force, not energy. Instead, friction is the cause of turning some Skirmel's energy into thermal energy as the sights of Skirmel should flare up every time they are sliding across the surface. This leaves us with Mysecule's line, where they are all based off of H2O, 
water, dihydrogen monoxide. The water molecule is known to have this Mickey Mouse shape with the two hydrogen atoms looking like ears on a big oxygen atom. In fact, there are other mons that are based off of the shape too. I have a problem with cast form, but I'll address that later. This way of drawing molecules is called the space filling model because it gives a general idea of how much space each of the molecule's atoms are taking up. Oxygen is bigger than hydrogen, so this shape makes sense. But sometimes for larger molecules, this might be hard to tell what atoms are where. So there's the ball and sick model. Hydrodent here is still showing H2O, but the spheres are scaled down so that lines can be drawn between each chemical bond. Simple enough, right? Again, this is just another way to show H2O, just like there's many ways to depict the same character. Instead, I'll use this time to tell you why this line is synchronized. Because water's hydrogens are slightly bent, the molecule loses symmetry in one of the axes. This means that electrons that are shared amongst the atoms hang out near the oxygen end more, making that part more negatively charged. This makes the water molecules something called polar because they got negative and positive poles. Uh, this is what makes water attracted to each other. If there was only a way to show this. The Vesepra theory is about the electrons I was talking about, and it offers an explanation as to why the water molecule is bent this way. You see, oxygen has 8 electrons in its outer shell, also called valence shell, and those electrons need somewhere to go. But electrons hate each other because they're both negative. The best way they can deal with each other is by forming pairs, and for oxygen, it makes a tetrahedral pyramid, like a D4. I know this is a lot. This, this is so much <laughs> to go over in a small video, but again, I'd love to go slower in a future video when I have the resources to do so, but for now, all this means is that cast forms boo should be ripped apart. I mean, people say it's a water molecule, which it barely looks like one because the angle's totally off. I mean, it could happen, but it's not the most stable shape where at the end of the day, it's just a poor excuse from making a sandstorm form. Just just please give me a sandstorm form. Even though the Vesepra theory is widely taught and explains, frankly, a lot of molecules, it is still called a theory. Thus, Vesepra is water psychic type. Woo. Whew, that was a lot. I'm not gonna lie, starters are pretty hard to make. It took me a few tries over several months before I got to a set that I liked. I ended up making some other mons that would show up earlier in the region before finalizing my starters. When people start to make these creatures, they often look at patterns established by companies that dominate the genre, like Pokemon. But what's important at the end of the day is that you should ask yourself, why would they follow that pattern? And if that reason applies to you. Maybe the starting trio is red, green, and blue because that's an eye-catching trio. Maybe you want to follow that. Maybe you want the first stages, the little babies, to have the ability to be made into plushies. And maybe that also helps making the design more compact and cute slash puntable. But on the other hand, when you see these patterns such as looking at Oh, every fire starter has to be from the Eastern Zodiac. I mean, even if that is true, why should you necessarily follow it? Like, how does that apply to your own project? So, I mean, yeah. For my mons, I wanted to cast a white net. So, Skirmel, for example, is based off of earlier Pokemon generations, where the final is like a big wild beast that is only tamed by you. While Viseparu is more like the contemporary anthropomorphic finals, that's like a friend that grew up with you. Say what you will with which is better or not, I'm not here to argue that. Everyone has their own tastes, and I'm just out here trying to establish a range of what my mods would look like. 
I hope you enjoyed hearing about my starters. The next demo video would go over some of the early route mods, and I'll also explain my personal reasons behind following those tropes. I also want to thank some websites such as FET, which is a website filled with educational simulations. I've shown some of their simulations here today in this video, but I definitely recommend you to go check it out. This isn't sponsored or anything, I just love the website. I also want to thank ballview.org for the molecular visualizer. They actually have an in-browser one, which was very handy and very accessible. All the other references and links are down below if you want to look up more about it. Again, there's a lot more I could talk about, but I'll have a deeper dive once I have the resources to do so. So before I end the video, I do want to mention that reason why I was putting off these videos. And it's all because of this secret. You see, I've had these creatures for about two years now, and I've got the motivation to finally make a game. Not a fan game, mind you, but my own game with a special mechanic and its own storyline inside. I'm nowhere near ready to present the game so far, but you can catch me talking about it on my streams on Mondays and Thursdays. I currently stream on Twitch around 8 p.m. EST. There's a lot more stuff to do, but hey, people like you who somehow find me, give me hope. So thank you again for watching, and I'll see you next time.